I'm Lee Jones and I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and the Professor of Clinical Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Sciences at the University of California, Davis. And I'm here with Shane Stoden, the Director of the Health and Aging Program at the Human Rights Campaign Fund and, and Founding Director of the Center for LGBT Health and Equity at the University of California, San Francisco. Shane, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Lee. Great. Could you start by telling us how you define inclusiveness in the context of an academic medical center? I, I don't know that I think inclusiveness at an academic medical center is any different from inclusiveness anywhere else. Uh, I always think of inclusiveness as having two wings, essentially. I'm first, you know, there, there are two aspects to inclusiveness that are, are really essential. And you, you, so often an institution, be it an academic medical center or any institution, attends to one a lot more than the other. So the first aspect or building block of inclusiveness that I think about is you've got to have basic equity and protection mm -hmm. in place for groups that have historically faced discrimination. I, I, so I'm not even thinking about inclusiveness as a general value for all people right. everywhere throughout time, but in terms of groups that historically have faced discrimination, first of all, you want to assure them at an academic medical center or anywhere else, you are going to be treated equally, you're going to experience equity, mm -hmm. you're going to be treated like everybody else. So you're giving them equity in terms of your policies, you're giving them equity in terms of benefits, you're giving them equity in terms of accommodations, and you're saying, not only are we creating these policies, we're going to follow up on them. Mm -hmm. We're gonna monitor them. We're going to enforce them. So one building block is equity and protection. Basic, no, sorry, founding principle. Right. But the other aspect is, of none of that really does a huge amount of good if you're not also as part of inclusiveness saying, we welcome you, we support you, mm -hmm. if you don't extend a warm welcome, if you don't bring those building blocks, those policies, those benefits, those accommodations to life, does someone really feel included? They feel like, well, you know, you have graven in stone that you'll treat me the same, you'll right. treat me equally, I see I have the same benefits, I see you do have an office, I see you take complaints, but I don't really feel like I'm seen, like I'm heard, I'm supported, you're, you know I'm here, and you're glad and you're proud that I'm here. Right. And if I run into problems related to the fact that I come from a historically discriminated against group, you'll be there for me. You won't necessarily know everything about my problem. You won't mm -hmm. be perfect, but you will care. You will get it. And you, you will get that you need to pay attention and to care, even if you don't have all of the answers or all the resources figured out. So there's the equity protection on the one hand and a warm welcome and support right. on the other. I think of these, you know, the two wings of the inclusiveness right. bird, and both are needed. So one's the more factual side, the other is the more relationship connection yeah, side. Yeah, you could see it that way. Yeah. One's, you know, more institutional and policy bound, the other is more relational. Right. And it's so important. I think this is where academic medical centers uh, particularly need to stop and think. There can be a tendency within medicine, within academic medicine, to largely attend to policies mm -hmm. and to practices, institutional policies and practices, and to overlook what might be seen there, not even subtleties or nuances, but the relational. How does someone actually feel at your institution? And I think that, that deserves as much care and attention and can be overlooked. Of course, it's harder. Right. Not that it's easy to form a committee and create a policy right. and, and accompanying monitoring. But it, yeah, it generally is considered more challenging to create the resources so that those students really feel cared for right. and, and seen. Part of the community. What's the role of inclusive institutional climate in academic medicine? Uh, well, I think, yeah, why, why would you do inclusive? <laughs> what's, the, what's the case right. for it? Not only what is it, but what's the case for it? So first of all, I think just as a, a basic principle, as an academic medical center, you want to look like the people of the country. You want to look like the people you serve, and in this case, resemble in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for, it, it, it's just absolutely necessary that academic medicine, like every other field in this country, resemble the country as a whole. And and we think that four to five percent of the country as a whole is LGBT, some form or fashion. Absolutely in academic medicine, although this can be vexed because of the difficulties of counting, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that uh, you have got representation from LGBT people in every aspect of, of academic medicine, of your medical center. So you want to resemble the people that you serve. That's incredibly important. You also want to feel you're doing the right thing, that mm -hmm. there's not any group of people at your academic medical center who are suffering because of who they are. 
you want to make sure that you are breaking with patterns, historic patterns of discrimination, and you are really not just committed to, but living out equity. <laughs> That's very mm -hmm. basic. More specifically, though, as an academic medical center, why do you care about inclusiveness? Because it's in inclusiveness, it's in the institutional climate where I think you really educate your students and your residents, mm -hmm. your faculty, about giving great care to LGBT people. You can have all kinds of LGBT material in the curriculum. All kinds of LGBT material. Of course, most of the LGBT material in the curriculum is the general material in the curriculum. As LGBT people, right. we don't go in. Just a very few exceptions, largely relating to transgender patients and people. We don't go in with anything different medically from anybody else. So you can teach about, already in your teaching in, in an medical school, you're already teaching about LGBT patients and teaching about great care and curriculum, clinical aspects in general. What's, what's the tricky part of being with your LGBT patients who present virtually no unique medical concerns? You should be screening everybody, after all, mm -hmm. for depression and smoking and STIs, et cetera. The challenging piece that inclusiveness can really address is how are you going to relate comfortably and supportively to your LGBT patient? You can know everything about health disparities affecting us. You can know everything about treating those particular health disparities. And yet, in that moment with your LGBT patient, be stressed, be uncomfortable, give rise to something that leads that patient to feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. not to pay good attention, not to comply or adhere, as we say, and not words that we love, but right. those are the words, um, even to be reluctant to seek healthcare in general, not just to, to see you again or right. do what you suggest, but reluctant to go back into healthcare in general. And it's inclusiveness in your institution more than anything else, the vibrant presence of LGBT people who are thriving and who don't hesitate to be seen and heard, that's going to teach your people, be they students, be they residents, be they faculty, it's going to teach how can you be comfortable with this group of people. LGBT patients, when you ask them, what's going wrong for you in healthcare, they don't talk about clinical curriculum components. They invariably say, I didn't think my provider was friendly. I thought he or she actually had a problem with me. Be they right or wrong, they had that impression. And that results, I mean, now we have data on this, thank goodness. I mean, when you and I first right. met 15 years ago, we didn't have any data right. on the impact on LGBT patients of feeling their provider was friendly. Now we know visits are delayed, visits never happen, compliance and adherence don't happen or are way delayed. Just because of the perception of, I don't think that person got who I was. I even think that person was unhappy or uncomfortable with me. It's your institutional climate where LGBT people speak are heard, where you have a chance to be comfortable, get comfortable with LGBT people that addresses this huge LGBT health concern. So it has a huge educational role to play, a co-curricular. You could even say the curriculum is co-climate. Right. I mean, I think it's, it's that inclusiveness is that important in educating students, faculty, and staff. So I really hear you saying is that uh, inclusiveness, is, inclusiveness is very much a huge part of the fiber, the very nature of Yep. Health education and health care. Oh, I think yeah. you, you talk about how to do great education in an academic medical center around LGBT patients. Have an institutional climate in which LGBT yeah. people thrive. That's how. Because I, there is otherwise, it, yes, there are standardized patient interactions. There are those. But of course, they're called standardized patient interactions for a reason. Right. They're scripted. Right. Uh, it's those informal, simultaneous interactions with LGBT students, faculty, and staff that really create the comfort and the information that we're looking for in a, in a, in a really good patient physician interaction. Great. So what are the challenges in creating this inclusive climate, specifically one that embraces LGBT and um, DSD-affected individuals? Yeah. <sighs> well, LGBT people in an institutional climate face some of the same concerns as other people who've historically been discriminated against. And then we have some unique concerns. So I'll just, in my experience, um, from the late 90s onward in academic medicine, think about mm -hmm. some of those challenges. Some of them, again, familiar from the struggles of other groups in academic medicine to be seen, to be heard, to be treated equally, to establish comfort. Some of them unique to LGBT people. Um, number one, you just have 
ignorance, a lack of knowledge. I actually prefer to use the term lack of knowledge rather than ignorance because I don't want to make it make someone wrong for not knowing about LGBT people. We've largely been invisible. We've only truly become visible in very, very recent years. So I don't want to label someone as ignorant. I'll just say there is, even in the year 2014, a very, very serious lack of knowledge. And I think one cut of that is academic medicine, you know, is a fairly sophisticated sphere of society. And so there are many people in academic medicine, especially in 2014, who say, look, I support marriage equality. I voted for it. If it were to come to a vote in my area, I'd be for it. I think non-discrimination should be the law of the land, and I supported it here in my, you know, my state, my municipality. I had a gay roommate in college. I watch Orange is the New Black. I see <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres. I've even watched the occasional episode of Drag Race. Yeah. I know what I need to know. And I think that can be, mm -hmm. so I, I don't want to just say a lack of knowledge is, is the issue in academic medicine. I think it's a little knowledge being construed as going a much longer way than it really does in terms of patient care. Because all of the having a gay roommate or having a, a transgender niece or uh, being a, an ally in support of LGBT equality doesn't mean that when that person who looks like your grandmother turns out to be a lesbian or perhaps to be someone born male, that doesn't mean that in that moment you're going to have the reaction that lets that person know, ah, oh, it's going to be okay. This person's still with me. So I think there's that, there's just the question of, of knowledge, basic knowledge about LGBT people, who we are, what resources exist for us in a given community, da da da. But being aware that just knowing somebody or being generally supportive doesn't tell you what you need to know. Another scenario, with a patient, yes, who happens to be LGBT, but what about a scenario in which you walk into the room as a non-LGBT physician and the patient greets you and says, I'm so glad to see you, perceiving you to be non-LGBT. I just had another doc in here who was, I'll just say I didn't feel, this is a male patient, I didn't feel very comfortable with him touching me, if you know what I mean, he's mm -hmm. a little that way. What do you do? Right. The fact that you even had a gay roommate in college, the fact that you watch Orange is the New Black religiously doesn't tell you how to respond, not just to an LGBT patient, but to other scenarios mm -hmm. that involve LGBT issues. So just a, a, a lack of information, a lack of knowledge, thinking knowledge goes farther than it really does. There also is the problem of actual bias and discomfort. Okay, I mean, I'll be candid with you, Lee, you know that I've traveled to many, many medical right. schools in this country, and I do know that there are still people in academic medicine who um, have bias against LGBT people, do not see us as fully human in some fairly prominent roles. That time is not over right. in our country. So that's one thing. There are people who hold fast to stereotypes. Who, you could throw all the data in the world at them, and they're completely convinced. I think you all, it's hard for me to believe you aren't in, in some ways in, slightly mentally disordered. Something's a little bit off, especially you transgender people. I feel like something's a little off there. You do have real issues of bias. That's at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the kind of discomfort, embarrassment, confusion that can seem benign but really isn't. Just not knowing how to respond. You know, you're not biased. You don't hang with stereotypes. You don't, you don't have an issue with LGBT people. But you just don't know how mm -hmm. to respond when someone comes out to you, especially when they're an unlikely comer outer. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't know. You're thinking, I, I know I'm supportive. I, I will want to be with right. you, but what do I say? I had a gay roommate. I watch Orange is the New Black. Right. I don't think. Right. What do you say when you learn? Not just when someone comes out to you, but when you learn subtly. Maybe, oh, I think they have a same-sex partner. Oh, I caught a glimpse. I think they might be transgender. What do you say? Do you just pass on as if nothing happened? Is that, is that the way to be cool and to indicate comfort? Mm -hmm. Or the recommended procedure, do you stop and say, ah, you know, th thank you for sharing that. Well, that's not always easy. So you can be unbiased, you can be comfortable in a larger sense, and, and yet not know, even if you're in academic medicine, how do you actually respond? Not just when a patient comes out, but when a student comes out to you, when a colleague comes out to you. How, so there can just be the embarrassment, confusion that results from not knowing what to say and not from high bias. So you have a lack of knowledge, you have uh, a, a spectrum of reactions in the moment with someone LGBT ranging from high bias, stereotyping to embarrassment and confusion. I'm with you, but what am I supposed what do to I say do? to you? Right. Those are issues. 
And then you have, um, still in the year 2014, I think you have academic medicine still wondering, aren't you a little different from those other groups in reality? We are very comfortable with saying in our diversity messaging and our diversity materials and websites and the things we write for our dean to say mm -hmm. at, at the welcome convocation, we're very comfortable saying we're very proud to have inclusion of, of the following groups of people. We're happy to have these percentages of people historically underrepresented discriminating. Mm -hmm. Do we really want you to be on that list? We, we're, not, we're not against you. We're fine with your being here. But if we really say we're actively committing and explicitly committing to LGBT equality and a, and a great institutional climate, is that really true? Or are we proud that you're here or are we just okay that you're here? And if we indicate that we're proud you all are here, LGBT people, is that gonna make other groups uncomfortable? Other groups that also mm -hmm. have been historically discriminated against, other groups that we want. If we include you in the diversity bucket, if we take the same kinds of active, explicit, verbal, verbalized stands for you that we do with other groups, how's that gonna look? Do we become known as the gay school? Do we drive away other groups that we'd like to attract? Do we make certain students and faculty uncomfortable? You know, they're o we're okay with having LGBT student, right. staff, and faculty here, but if we go beyond that to create special activities and inclusive messages, do we drive other groups away? Right. Do we make people uncomfortable? I don't think, Lee, that there's another group in academic medicine around whom that's a concern. Mm -hmm. If we lift up this group and we commit to their equity, we do inclusive practices, Will that be a problem for some people in other groups? And that, that's an aspect of LGBT inclusiveness. I think it's the elephant in the room that's seldom really addressed. How do you get people to a point where they feel like, you know, it might actually make some folks uncomfortable. We might become known to some people as the or a gay school. Maybe we're still willing to stand up for right. equity inclusiveness. <laughs> Let's think about that. Right. Let's talk about that. Great, well, so you've actually answered the next question, which ah. is providing uh, examples of challenges um, at institutions, because you've been to so many institutions, and I yeah. think you just sort of highlighted several there. Do you have anything yeah. else you'd like to add as far as I think they're challenges? the more garden, yeah. I think th there's just can be an absence of the kinds of uh, support services, the kinds of messages, the kinds of benefits uh, that you want to have in place. You can have a group thinking about diversity at an entire academic medical center and have never come up sometimes, even in the year 2014, LGBT aspects of diversity. It can, or it can be the caboose. Well, we've had eight meetings. The first seven meetings will attend to what we, you know, is traditionally right. thought of as diversity, safe diversity, diversity that people don't really have a problem with, or if they have a problem with it, they keep it very much to themselves. And at the end, when we've done the stuff that really matters, that's really most important, then we'll cover LGBT mm -hmm. diversity. So thinking, in other words, I, I think an, um, another challenge can be, well, we don't really hear that anything is wrong LGBT-wise. No one's knocking on our door and saying, mm -hmm. how are you all doing with respect to LGBT issues? No outside force is asking how we're doing. We don't hear much from LGBT students or staff or faculty. We're probably doing okay. We probably can safely attend to the forms of diversity that are brought to our attention externally and that are talked about a lot internally. And I think, of course, what can be off in that is that, and I think this is a challenge, again, that's unique to LGBT people that is not shared by other groups, for us to speak up about something that's wrong with the climate or missing from the climate, we have to come out. and. That is a huge problem. If what you're complaining about is the response of somebody to your being LGBT, how likely is it that you're going to go and make it known that you've just had a problem around being LGBT? So there can be this kind of false sense of it's probably okay here. We're in a pretty big city. I think there's a gay bar. Um, they just showed a LGBT movie without a, a problem at a nearby theater. I think we're all kind of cool that and not realizing that you have to do some special dialoguing, some special, take some special measures, 
bring in people actively in order to find out what's going on LGBT-wise because to complain and to talk about this as an LGBT person involves coming out when by definition you've already got some signals that you're not out. So those, of course, they are the other challenges of, and these are much talked about. I mean, you and I were at UCSF for a long time, Uh, even at well-resourced schools. Resources aren't infinite. If no one much is knocking on the door externally, if we don't hear a lot internally, if we have a lot of demands from other groups, if we have a lot going on in our institution generally, where do we find the resources to do something and where do we find the guidance to do something about what seems to be a relatively small and quiet Mm -hmm. group? Okay. So what are strategies for creating an inclusive institutional climate specifically to these populations, to this group of people? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, mm-hmm. I have written a book on this. Right. <laughs> I, I, You've been living it for I, I decades. I have been living it, and I, 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 I finally, after living uh, at UCSF, being the person responsible ultimately. And you know, that's an interesting question. Who's responsible? Well, for a while, before an institution itself takes on responsibility for LGBT inclusiveness, realistically speaking, it can be the job of some dedicated students, faculty, and staff. Mm -hmm. And that was the case in my institution, as as, as in many institutions. Who's responsible for this? Well, technically we all are, of course, the dean on down. Who's really responsible? Some very dedicated, active people. So there I was at UCSF. I was running the only LGBT office in an academic medical center or medical center or medical school anywhere in the country. So I really was responsible for mm-hmm. enhancing the climate for right. LGBT students, staff, and faculty. And, and so I, I did develop a whole slew of, of practices there at UCSF. And then as I left UCSF to go to the human rights campaign, I thought, you know, I think I, I, think I should write these down. So I did write about 40 recommendations in a, uh, uh, that were published, uh, so a, short, right. a short book, I want to assure people, right. um, published by the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. So I'm sort of in the position of over those 40 or so recommendations for right. a great institutional climate, how do I pick a few? So, right. But I will, Okay. because I know we don't have all this right. time in the world. So number one, you have to have the equity and protection building blocks in place. You've got to have an LGBT non-discrimination policy, and I emphasize the T because many schools historically have sexual orientation in their non-discrimination policy. They have yet to add gender identity and expression. So they're covered LGB-wise, lesbian, gay, bisexual-wise. They don't have transgender. Not, they're not standing up against transgender non-discrimination. So you want to have the policy in place, and you want to be monitoring it. You don't want to just have it in place. Few. Our committee <laughs> enacted the policy that's over. Your work has just begun, especially because of the difficulty LGBT people have filing complaints and coming out and mm-hmm. wondering, I know you're accustomed to taking complaints around, say, race, race or ethnicity. How, how are you with LGBT matters? Mm-hmm. You need to make sure your complaint recipients, the, the, the officials uh, receiving complaints are well-trained. You need to monitor what's going on, and you need to follow up when you see you've got especially trouble nodes in your academic medical center. You've got to have equal benefits. You have got to be providing the same health coverage to, to same-sex partners, not just spouses, but partners, that you do to different sex spouses. You need to make sure that you add transgender coverage to your insurance policy. You need to make sure you're set. Uh, when someone uh, either indicates that they're transgender or indicates that they're about to transition from one sex to another, you've got to be ready for that. That is a moment when tremendous inequities, not just confusion <laughs> and, uh, can, and, and, and distraction can occur, but inequity can occur at that moment. You want to make sure you're set for that. So having those, those equity building blocks in place is critical. You also want to be sure whenever you are talking about diversity at your institution, a website, the dean's message, your, your pamphlets and brochures on diversity, You've got to include LGBT people, mm-hmm. even though you may be scared that will put off other diverse groups. You, you do, you need the rainbow imagery in there. Put in the image of the, the table at the admitted students <laughs> welcome that has the rainbow mm-hmm. tablecloth on it. Make sure that LGBT people are included in your diversity. Obviously, that includes admissions, recruitment and admissions. Again, this is where concern can be particularly high. If we reach out to LGBT people, will we lose other groups? Right. We're speaking in high schools. We're speaking in colleges. We're doing a brochure. Do we need a special brochure for LGBT? You kind of look like you might be one, but I don't know if we want to put that out on the table along with the others. You need to do, not just, of course, in student recruitment, but in faculty. You've got to make sure that you're sending an inclusive message, 
meet inclusion, and, you know, we don't discriminate on the basis of LGBT right. status along with race and ethnicity. You want to make sure that your interviewers, whether they're for admissions or for faculty and staff hiring, certainly aren't biased, but also know what to do when someone's disclosed their LGBT. If an applicant either on the resume, on the CV, or in person happens to mention a same-sex partner, or, yeah, actually, that was back when my, my name and my gender were different. Yeah. You want to make sure that in that moment, right. all goes well. So admissions and hiring and recruitment are a key area. Another thing is, I know I mentioned this before, but it, it can't be said enough. Policies, messaging, brochures, websites, uh, in the immortal words of the great health educator Duke Ellington, they don't mean a thing without that training. Right. You've got to train folks. And not only, I mean, you're in student affairs, of course. Right. In student affairs, yes, crucially, you want your people to be trained. You want the counselors to be trained. Right. You want the frontline staff to be trained. You want the registrar staff to be trained. But you have to think beyond student affairs. This cannot be just the burden and the responsibility of student affairs, <laughs> to mention the, the, the one LGBT person who's out in student affairs right. to take care of. You need to be training your security guards right. who may arrest your transgender student for being in the wrong bathroom. Right. You need to train your outside counseling staff. Crucially, you need to train your senior administrators and your faculty. Although it's difficult, you need to find creative, engaging ways to reach out to your, your faculty. And, and, your, and the deans. People say, well, gosh, you know, we're not going to be able to get the deans in a meeting about LGBT issues. Actually, not only is it at least as important that they ed be educated about LGBT issues as anybody else, but often they don't have the opportunity right. just to sit down and hear about these issues. People are a little afraid to approach them about an area. And they may be enormously sophisticated in some area of medicine. Right. They may be a giant in academic medicine in general, but just a person especially because they are eminent and their right. time is scarce. Just a person who may never have had a chance to learn anything about LGBT issues. And, and, and yet they're the people who are least likely to get that education. So you've got to do training. Beyond that, you have got to set up activities that support programs that support LGBT students. So there are two ways of doing that. One is you've got to set a program specifically for them. I mean, and, and there are two basic programs. I say if, 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 if an academic medical center, ac a medical school isn't doing these two programs, they're really, really missing major opportunities in their institution. One is you must have a program that's titled something like The Doctor Is Out. You must indicate that, yes, there are out physicians on the planet. They are right there within your academic medical mm -hmm. center, right there within your medical the, It is a program that will draw not only LGBT students and staff and faculty, all kinds of people will show up to go, really? Even in the year 2014, really? LGBT, really on our faculty, really? It's a marvelous moment. The doctor is out, just indicating, yes, we're here, we're here. Right. And ask us anything, hear our stories. The other one, of course, and this is an issue that is huge for LGBT students, and yet virtually unknown still, in today's world to faculty and administrators is, can I be out? I may have been out in college. I may have been out in medical school. Can I be out in residency? Can I be out as a physician? Particularly in a specialty that's not historically renowned for its love of diversity and especially LGBT diversity. So if you're not second doing a program that's somehow dealing with issues of being out in residency, you're really missing a key concern, and that's another program that many, many people will come. LGBT students who have hesitated to go to other things that I'll mention in a moment, nonetheless will get themselves to being out in residency because they are so Concerned. wondering. Interview, essay, what about the dean's letter? Do I wait? Do I even not pursue that specialty because I happen to be LGBT? Right. So those are, are very basic. Um, otherwise, of course, you just want to make sure that all of your programming that you're putting on for students is LGBT inclusive. That if you're doing a panel on, can you have kids and be a medical student? Make one of those parents LGBT. Oh. Uh, to send the larger message that we are parents and you will encounter in your practice people who are parents and also LGBT. LGBT. Shane, thank you very much. Um, it's been very helpful and informative. Great. This afternoon. So glad. My pleasure.